Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Inspire Health Podcast. And we brought back a guest that I've had on a couple of different times on the show, Dr. Tom Cowan. And in the past, we have usually talked with Tom more around viruses and viral theory and um, exosomes and all of that sort of world primarily tied around health. And in when we were starting off our conversation, I was like, Tom, what do you want to talk about today? And he said, really, like, almost anything other than around biology and viruses and all this kind of stuff. So we decided to have a really open conversation around, I mean, Dr. Dr. Tom Cowan's got a really diverse background and I really love the way that he talks about a lot of different um, areas of life. So not just health, but he has a, a really different perspective in a way that I think encourages other people to think outside of the box. And so I really enjoy our conversations. And today we decided to talk a lot around our kids around the educational system, around what the difference between schooling and educating is. We talk a little bit about health as well, but we also talked about the financial system and finances and communities and what even the concept of exchange for value can even look like and how communities maybe need to develop in a different way than how they currently are operating in order to create a system that might be beneficial for everyone. and. We really get into a lot of different conversations. They're really just a, a very candid conversation around different topics that I think many of us are all exploring at this time. So I hope you guys really enjoy this episode. I always like chatting with Dr. Cowan, and um, and this time actually was the first time Taya got to join us too. So kind of fun to have a, the three of us all having this conversation. One other thing too is make sure if you have not, please subscribe to the newsletter, not just the YouTube channel and the Instagram and all of those kind of things. If these channels eventually go down, the only way we're going to be able to have contact with you is directly through the actual Inspire Health podcast email list. The other thing too is that we are also offering different courses through the Inspire Life Multiversity platform. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, I'll put a link there and go and take a look at the different courses that are being offered there. We are collaborating with different guests that we have really enjoyed working with, as well as just courses that I'll put together myself. But we've got a really amazing course coming out called Spirituality 101 with Giulio Consiglio. So Giulio has been a guest on the show several times. We really value his insights into the world of spirituality and metaphysics. He's an author, he's a spiritual teacher, and um, really has a beautiful way of just making sense of what is going on in this world. And particularly over the past several years, I know that both Tan and I have had um, much consolation just working with him too. And so there is a course that he is offering for the first time that is coming out and you want to get on the email list because you are going to be privy to bonuses that are only going out there if you're on the email list. So just go to Inspire Health Podcast and subscribe to the channel. It's very easy to do. And then get on the wait list as soon as you can for that course if this appeals to you because there will be some bonuses that will be going out by the end of next week. And if you're not on the waitlist, you will miss out. So check that stuff out. I really feel right now that things that are incredibly important are to gain some perspective of what is going on in the world and where we need to focus our attention and focus our energies, because I really do feel things are going to be continually changing and we need to be in a place where we are operating in a certain way so that we can really navigate the changing world in a way that is going to be most advantageous and beneficial for ourselves and for others. So please check those things out at Inspire Life Multiversity. Just go to inspirehealthpodcast.com and click on courses and you'll see all of that info. All right, everybody, much love to everybody. Please make sure to subscribe, to share, to like, all of that stuff helps us with these algorithms and get this message out as much as possible. All right, enjoy the episode with Dr. Cowan. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast, and we continue on with our series on creating new earth, a collaborative mission. And today we're bringing back Dr. Tom Cowan. Tom's been on the show a few different times with us back in the series that we did on science, mysticism and beyond. We, he was a part of the cleanse and detox series. I'll put links to both of those so you guys can check that out. Really fascinating interviews and, and lots of different information covered. So 
hopefully we'll tie into some different stuff today. This might be a little bit different than what you're used to with, uh, with Tom. But um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Tom's led lectures and workshops throughout the U.S. Mm -hmm. on so many different topics around health and medicine. He's authored six different books, including The Contagion Myth, um, cancer in the new biology of water, human heart, cosmic heart, breaking the spell, and others. And we thought it would be wonderful to have Tom on the show today. As I was going through his work, the on on your website, Tom, at the end it just says, "It's my sincerest wish and expectation that we will forge a new world together, a world that is clean, safe, and governed by joy instead of fear." one that meets the true needs of all living beings. This is the world I want for myself, my children, my grandchildren, all people, animals, plants, and microbes. Join me in remembering the way the world can be if we only learn to see clearly. Here, here. Love that. So I thought, well, we got to have you on the show for this series because that's kind of the whole concept of this Creating New Earth. So Tom, welcome to the show again. Thank you. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's always, always fun to chat with you too. And, uh, as I was looking through, you've been get lots of stuff going on right now, which we'll we'll get into as we go along on your site. But I'd love to touch back with remembering the way the world can be if we only learn to see it clearly. This seems to be what's coming up on a big scale. And my question would be, what's fogging our vision? What has been fogging our vision? And we could pick this well outside of of just health and wellness. But what are some of the things that, from your perspective, we need to clear out and actually see in a new way in order to actually forge this new world into existence? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, off the top of my head, I would say the things that are standing in the way of seeing the way the world really is, is a combination of ignorance, school, shame, and trauma. And what I mean by that is when you're a young child and you see things and experience things, you're typically uh, told that's not the way it is. And then eventually in school, you're told if you keep thinking like that, you're a bad boy or girl or maybe something else now. Um, so, so you learn, most people, children learn that they better keep quiet because something bad might happen. Uh, some of them learn there's something wrong with me, so I better keep quiet like big time. And some of them, maybe a little bit like me, don't really give a damn what those people think and keep trying to figure it out for themselves. And so we learn that, and then comes all the rewards and punishments that go along with that. If you uh, decide to see, think, to believe things that you see and you understand for yourself, as opposed to what you're told, then bad things will happen. You'll get flunked, you'll get teased, you'll never get a job. And nowadays, you even get put on drugs, uh, which make it so you can't even feel or think anything. Uh, so there's a lot of bad consequences that happen. And the interesting thing is, most of these things that you're threatened with, if not done to, are the most important people in your life, like your parents and your teachers and your brothers and sisters and your friends. And we all seem to have some sort of tribal instinct, like the worst th thing we want to happen to us is get kicked out of the tribe so we get eaten by lions. So we tend to avoid that. And then if you fast forward, you live your whole life with that primal fear that I'm going to get kicked out of the tribe and eaten by lions. And you don't even know, remember where that came from. And all you know is somehow I better think like everybody else thinks, no matter how irrational it is. Uh, and if you don't, something bad is going to happen to you. 
let, let me give you just a, I, I happened to read an example of this uh, five minutes ago, which, uh, so this is way off the subject, but the subject of the book uh, is there is no such thing as a nuclear or atomic weapon. And that what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki where they did not explode nuclear or atomic weapons. Those things have never existed, have never been used. They can't possibly exist. And the whole book is a, a explanation of that. Now, whether you believe that or not, uh, so one of the things he shows you is, is supposedly when, and this I think will demonstrate my point, uh, they say that the heat and the light of these uh, Nagasaki Hiroshima explosions was so, so intense that it created shadows on, on like fences, right? So you see a picture of the shadow of a allegedly vaporized person. So the person is gone. Nothing left of the person. All you see is this shadow etched into the wall right so you see that and we've all seen images like that we've all seen pictures like that and you say to yourself holy shit that's like a really bad weapon i gotta be scared of that now how many people ask the following question how come the wall didn't burn down it's made of wood it's like old old wood this is a thousands of degree blast furnace. And you mean to tell me that the wooden wall withstood these amazing heat and winds of a thousand miles an hour? It's like a rickety wooden wall. And so the problem is we see we see things like that all the time. And we are schooled into somehow not saying, as I've said over and over again, the most important question or saying you can ask or think is, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Wait wait a minute. Like, how come the wall didn't burn? <laughs> like, that's, that's, that can't happen like that. And, it, oh, if you if you say how come the wall didn't burn out, you're 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 like bad. We're gonna flunk your sorry ass, and you know, and you're never gonna get a job or anything. Mm -hmm. And we see these things all the time. Uh, you know, we see them in politics, we see them in money. You know, we we were talking a bit about money before. So, you know, I don't know how many of your your listeners know that somehow the government has outsourced the creation of money to a bunch of private banks. Like, and I asked in my heart book, how come they don't out give me the right to make the money? They would call them Cowans. So every time I want to buy a house, because <laughs> I can make money, right? And you can't, you have to work for money. And you have to work for money of the people that I designate to have an adequate supply of Cowans. I can guarantee you I get the house and you don't, <laughs> right? Because I can make more money and you can't because you have to get it from me. So the, here's the guarantee of that of that system. Somebody will end up with all the money like the people who make the money and the rest of you won't now if you like that system where because most of the people listening my guess don't are not one of the people who makes the money <laughs> <laughs> like me i'm not i don't, I don't make the money uh i, I wish i was because then i you know i i'd sort of do the right thing but i'm not now, the people who do, they have more money than I do because they can make as much as they want. And there's it's not tied to anything. You know, there's nobody watching them. 
There's nobody auditing them. There's nobody. And, and so you have all these politicians and people talking about, oh, we're going to change the system, right? And you say, okay, let's start. So let's stop giving them the right to make the money. <laughs> Because as long as you do, they're always going to win and you're going to lose. And and that's the way it's going to be, obviously. No, we can't do that. We're going to redistribute the money that the rest of us have, or we're going to make programs and invest. I mean, it's all. And, and yet we see those things. So some people don't see that, right? Because they don't know that that's the way it works. But But even if you tell people that's the way it works. No. What do you mean, no? No, it can't be like that because that's like stupid. Like <laughs> our our the people, like our politicians, they're they're not that stupid. They wouldn't allow something like that. They they always that's one of the interesting uh things about our system is that people think these people like viruses. They can't be that stupid to just make up a fire. <laughs> like they can't be. It's ridiculous. But they did. And that's interestingly, uh, it's like Hitler said. You if you if you tell a normal lie, people catch on because everybody tells normal lies. But if you tell a real whopper, right, then no every everybody thinks no. Nobody would say that whopper because because like everybody will catch him and you'd be embarrassed or shamed or something. Anyways, I went on for a while there, but. No, that's great. Dr. Cowan, you touched on so many um, important points there. We were driving around in town just the other day and I noticed a few vans um, going past us. There was a Rogers van, there was a Tullis van and there was another electrical van and and I came to the realization, you know, when we spoke with Kathy O'Brien, she talked about the the traumatized mind. And once a brain or once a person has been traumatized, the brain segregates and separates everything and has doesn't is not able to cohesively link one incident or situation to another, or one part of the brain isn't even able to communicate with another. And I thought of how our world has been set up in that we all, you know, as far as professions and occupations, we all kind of get a piece of it, you know, go do and change these wires is is what the instructions are given to the electrician to do. And, and the Talus company is is told, okay, you go and do this piece of it. And before you know, it, we have the 5G uh, towers erected and the signals that are being put out to the population is causing all sorts of issues which nobody is aware of but all these people who contributed and and did their piece they have um they have all taken part in something that has that is essentially causing harm but i feel like because we each and every one of us are getting just a piece of it we're not able to know all of it know the agenda that's taking place Um, These people at the top who, you know, print the money and and have the power and are delegating the things that need to be done, they have the full picture and knowing of what's happening. But what's what's taking place right now, I feel like on a global scale, little by little, you know, whether it be the photon belt that we're moving through or whatever is taking place um, spiritually or otherwise, we're all awakening to the bigger picture of what's happening. And we're starting to question the peace that we've been dealt with and the peace that we have um, obediently um, instigated and pushed forward for so long. And how, how do you see this shifting right now? Because obviously we know that you've been quite vocal and outspoken about what you've been seeing. And, you know, you've had, um, as as a child of the governments, <laughs> you had your wrist slapped and your license taken away and told you're a bad boy and and Jason as well. So like what now from here? What are you looking to do differently moving forward? Well, number one, I never had my license taken away. So that's uh, incorrect. Okay. I, I quit 
voluntarily. Yeah, they exactly. called it surrendered, which I didn't like that word, but that's mm -hmm. the word they uh, they made me use that word. So they, nobody ever took my license away, not for even one day. Uh, but if I if I may challenge you a little bit here, uh, because I think it illustrates how, how one of the ways we got into this mess uh, is we we voluntarily atomize ourselves uh, with, I would say, no good evidence that 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 atomization we just did is actually true. So let me give you an example. Uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but you said something to the effect of of when something happens, your brain goes, it does something right. It, it shifts. So how do you know it's your brain that did that? the reason i ask is because i would be shocked if you knew it was your brain uh, you may have been told it's your brain you may have even seen some research that your brain does such and such a thing uh, but i can tell you if i looked at that research i would have a lot of questions because i don't think my brain does anything i don't no, maybe it does. Uh, I think I do something and my brain, I think, is some some kind of part of that in a way that's mysterious and I don't really get. And I don't think it's because I'm stupid or ill ill read. I think we don't know that. And right now we can't know that. And the, the reason I bring that up is we do that to ourselves all the time. And, you know, the one of the things that, the as they say, the powers that shouldn't be know is they learned this over and over again, but they also learned it, I believe, in the Soviet Union, is the best jailer of people are themselves. Because if you try to, imprison people they sometimes rebel depends but whereas if you get them to do it to themselves they not only comply but they recruit other people to comply and the way we do that to ourselves is we say well it's my nervous system that can't handle this or my, you know, if somebody scares me, it's my parasympathetic nervous system that goes wonky or it's my estrogen that's, you know, out of whack. So I scream at my husband, uh, you know, in menopause. Interestingly, if you try to prove that women have a chemical called estrogen in their bodies, I can guarantee you can't prove it. What you can show is that if you take a sample of somebody's blood or biological fluid and then mix it with some chemicals, you can get a reaction which you call estrogen. And if you say, to, if you ask the question, because we've forgotten in medicine and biology that the way you look for something to a large extent determines the outcome. If you say, how do you know that that mixing it with a chemical didn't produce that reaction, that chemical, which we call estrogen, and that it wasn't there while the person was alive? And you know what the answer is? They don't know. Did you do a control? So you you've tried, you found it by not mixing it with the chemical? No. Why not? Well, because there isn't a control you could do. So that's, this is an assumption. Now, this is a very important thing, because when you go back to how they found DNA, right? DNA is a huge part of our culture. You know, Steph Curry, the basketball player, when they asked him why the Warriors won the NBA, he said, winning is in our DNA, right? So he's like... <laughs> You say, you say, Steph, how did they discover DNA? He doesn't know. Ask your doctor. Do doctor says, you, what's, I have a, this thing, you know, like I can't hear properly. Well, it's genetic, right? It's in your DNA. So, doc, 
how did they discover DNA in the first place? Right? You'd think you'd know that because that's your job. He doesn't know. Turns out they take white blood cells, extract the nuclei, mix it with sulfuric acid. Then they get sulfur-rich chemicals, and those are proteins because that's what proteins allegedly are. Then a guy named Meissner, I can't remember the exact date, 1910 or so, decides to mix it with phosphoric acid instead. He gets phosphorus-rich chemicals, and those aren't proteins because they don't have phosphorus according to the definition. So those are phosphorus-rich chemicals found in the nucleus. That's DNA. You say, yo, Meissner, how do you know that the phosphorus didn't come from the phosphoric acid that you that you extracted the chemicals with instead of your previous sulfuric acid that you got sulfur rich? You, did, you, did you like do a controller? No, uh, we just know that that's got to be phosphor. I mean, and then everybody listening to will will think to themselves. This is what I was saying before. Seriously, like, are they that stupid? Like, the guy didn't think that maybe he was getting phosphorus-rich chemicals because he was using phosphoric acid to extract the chemicals from a nuclei instead of sulfuric acid, like my three-year-old would think that. But somehow, that's the still to this day, essentially, the extraction process. And you start seeing these things, and I don't remember your question even, but you one of the ways you, I think, get out of this is it's the words we use about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So don't say you're, it's your brain that's doing this, unless you know for absolute sure. It's your mm -hmm. estrogen. It's your autonomic nervous system. Uh all those are victim consciousness. It's not me. I didn't yell at my husband because I'm 55 and pissed off all the time. It's because I have low estrogen. So you go to the doctor, he gives you, yep, you got low estrogen, give it estrogen. And then <laughs> I still yell at my husband. Guy pisses me off. Uh, but, but now you feel better except then you get breast cancer because it doesn't really work. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of the ways we get into it. So if I was to give people advice, don't atomize yourself. Don't say things that you don't know that that's true. Because you tell yourself, you bamboozle yourself into being a victim. And that, you know, as my friend Kelly Brogan said, there's only one disease, and that's called being victim. Mm -hmm. That's the root of all illness. So, Tom, I, I totally hear what you're saying on all of that. So, because it's it's like everything is sort of drenched and saturated in all of this sort of type of thinking for so long. So, from a perspective of you know wellness, someone comes in with whatever whatever is ailing them, whatever is bothering them what really because i mean a, a lot of that stuff then that can just be a waste of time a waste of money it can take you down routes that are actually giving you a false sense of what might be at the root of it and, and actually keeping you away from addressing what maybe actually needs to be looked at where when people are dealing with certain things where is a good place to start and what from your perspective and what you've seen what is what needs to just be moved aside like is not worth even checking well the first thing is the the word wellness i would totally get rid of that word it's absolutely inappropriate for the situation that we're in now and we we do not have a wellness clinic there's nothing i i i have nothing to do with wellness why wellness means you're well right you're fine so i've asked maybe 50,000 people in various lectures over the year. And I can ask you too, how many people out there have all, they have all 32 teeth are perfect, intact, straight, 
no decay, haven't lost a tooth. Raise your hand. You know how many people have raised their hand? Nobody. None. Every one of those people, including me, by the way, including me, are in a advanced state of decay. <laughs> right? Your your basic structures for that you need for life, like your teeth, are falling apart, literally decaying in your mouth. Now, here's another one. Uh, there's a, a book I haven't read the whole thing, but it's it's got a, about barefoot the 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 the, the dangers of wearing shoes. As soon as you wear shoes, you live your life going down on an incline. It changes the orientation of your knees and your hips and the way your head sits on your frame. Everything about you is messed up as far as your structure. Now, I I could have I haven't, but I could have asked all these 50,000 people, how many of you have never worn shoes and uh, your frame is perfectly intact? You know what the answer is? Nobody. I mean, there used to be people. They never, I was, when I was in Africa, nobody had shoes. It's ridiculous. Like, and it messes you up for life. Therefore, nobody is well. And so there's nothing about wellness. So, how do you do a medical practice? Uh, you, a person comes in, you know they're messed up, right? Because <laughs> they wouldn't be here. Uh, there's no American who's not messed up. Fund not only structurally, their teeth are rotting, and they have so many things going on in their whatever, call it like a mind, that are, you know, it's like William Casey, the head of the CIA, said, when we're done with our disinformation program, everything the American public believes is a lie. Not some things, everything. everything, everything the typical American believes, according to the program of the CIA, like that's the goal. Not It's not like an inadvertent. That was the goal. So if you believe something different than knowing something, it's it's almost for sure a lie. So you believe in viruses and government's trying to help you and you go to school to get educated and the money is 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 you know all this stuff you all that's just a lie so but this it's not all lost because in most people with the right questioning they can tell you what ails them so that's what you add what ails thee my foot and then you let them tell the story of your foot of their foot it starts Three months ago, what happened then? Every morning I get up, my wife stomps on my foot. Same <laughs> foot? Yes. Same place? Yeah. And what happens then? I tell her to stop and she won't. I don't know why she does it. It's probably estrogen or something. Uh, so so then, and so let me, you know, so now here I have three months later, my, my foot is re it's really hurts bad. Let me see your foot. Yeah, it's all swollen. So I trust because I've been through this enough that somehow the person knows a where, what they need to deal with right now and what happened to them. It's if you're willing to listen and listen with empathy. And I got this from Carl Rogers of, of the strategy. Cause we never ask why just when did it happen? How did it happen? What's the story? I want the story of your life. Then I then I then I repeat it back to them. So your foot was fine three months ago. Your wife started stomping it because she took start taking estrogen for menopause, and now your foot hurts. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and then they say to me, "Say Tom, do you think the reason my foot hurts because my wife keeps stomping on my foot?" I say, "Yeah, let's try that out." So for the next month. Let's not have your wife stomp on your foot. Like as soon as you wake up, run to another room and see if it'll like mitigate. So they, they do that because they can see that that makes sense. Now, 
let me say an important thing here. There's no theories or models involved in this process, right? There's no DNA, viruses, autoimmune disease, conceptions about, you know, polyphenols and what they do to your health. Not saying they don't, but uh, there's none of that. There's just the reality of what happened to you in, in your life. People know and then they do something about it. It worked, right? And then you, you've you made their life better, which is the only thing we're about. Make your life better. We're not curing anybody's, you know, tendonitis in their foot because it doesn't exist. It's just that's what happened. And then you move on and you move on and you move on unraveling the 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 pit that we all got in if by the time we're three but 50 and then at the end of the day you're a lot better and that's all we're that's all you can do there's no the whole disease model is wrong the whole curing people thing is wrong it's just working with stories to get people better and out of all these theoretical models that we've learned are the realities of our life and almost all of them, if not all of them, are just bogus. Mm-hmm. I, I I like that, Tom. It's it's reminds me of some of the, I mean, different, but that concept has come up in different ways around that ultimately the answers are within ourselves. We just have yeah. to sort of allow them to express themselves. And, and that's come in different ways. I mean, we're talking to someone who's done... Um, different sort of work that ties in with hypnosis where that's literally like the higher self comes in and, and explains to them what they need to know. That's sort of based on like Dolores Cannon's work and different things. So I think different approaches, but at the end of it, she was not even saying like, this isn't something you even have to go into hypnosis for. You can actually access it yourself um, by by partly, I think, being in a state where you are, you know, able to genuinely allow that information to come up and not block it but um that's the role of the practitioner Mm -hmm. that that's captured in that saying you know when two or more are gathered in my name i will be there now you could that that's also a sort of a model but but that's the reality of the situation i and i know that from personal experience over and over that's all i did a person came in what happened to you what 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 are you feeling because i knew that they know yeah. and they they as soon as you communicate l- let me say another thing about that because i did it a lot with children and it what happens is a child says you know uh so what's up child says i hate my sister mother says oh johnny you're such a bad boy for hating your sister. Like, she's so nice to you. So that's one approach to life. My approach was, which sister? Mm -hmm. The younger one. How many sisters do you have? Three. Do you hate the older ones? No. What? When did you start hating the younger one? Six months ago. And then the whole story, she puts sand in his bed or whatever it is. And that it, He's not bad or wrong or should be shamed. He's got a good story and usually a good reason. And if you tell it back to him, so what happened is six months ago, you, this is what happened. Is that right? Yes. Is there anything I can do to, yeah. Tell her not to put sand in my bed. Good. Mm -hmm. I got it. Okay. She may not listen to me. So then we have to figure out why, you know, what, what she thinks is the reason for doing that. You, but that's how you solve problems. If you're going to go down the, oh, you're wrong and don't say that, you 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 got nothing. Mm-hmm. Except an you, angry boy. Yeah. <laughs> How do you find for um, people that have had, I guess there's a point, do you find like in the telling of the story and then the replaying it back that there's just awarenesses that open up for the person that allow them to maybe see it differently or let go of situations i'm thinking of people that maybe have had um you know more significant 
um, trauma to them or something along those lines where something's happened that's maybe they come to it and, you know, maybe they were abused or something along those lines. How does the, how does this practice assist with the, with that? Yeah, it, it, it happens all the time. Here's an example. Guy comes in, 20 year old guys, a real story, Guillain Barre syndrome, par paralyzed both legs. They're not totally paralyzed now, but he walks with the crutches. So what happened? I I was fine at 11. And then I go through, so I hear from him that proof that he was fine. Played soccer, captain of my soccer, you know, worked in my machine shop with my dad, all this stuff, ate normal food, right? So we know he's fine, his words. What happened then? I My mother took me for a flu shot. What happened then? A week later, I was paralyzed from the waist down. What happened then? I went to six neurologists. They all told me it wasn't the flu shot, that it was just, you know, I had the cold and that Guillain-Barre happens. So I've had all this therapy and gamma globulin and transfusions. And 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 now I'm coming to you and think you could help. So I tell the story back. It just like you say, this light goes on. He says to me, do you think it was the flu shot? I said, I don't know. I just told you your story. <laughs> and by the way, here's the package insert, which I used to have for the flu shot. It says one of the side effects is Guillain-Barre. Now, here's what's interesting and what told me whether the person would get better or not. 100%, one of two things happened at that point. They either cried or laughed. I knew it was that flu shot. I'm never listening to those neurologists again. I knew it was. And they told me that it wasn't. Now comes the next thing, which is really the whole thing in medicine. He says, which I totally applaud and agree with. You tell me, you, Tom Cowan, how I get over that flu shot or I'm going to somebody else. Right. I don't have any compliance problems. I'm not convincing him to do IV this or take silica, gets rid of aluminum or anything. He's telling me at that point, you either do you know how to get rid of the effects of a flu shot? Yes. Or I think I do, you know, or OK, because if you don't, I want you to tell me right now and I'm going to somebody else and I, or I'll figure it out for myself that patient will 100% get better. He's he's going to go and figure it out for himself and he's good and we're going to do something or we I'll tell I say, you know, I've dealt with this before, do this, come back in a month, 100% total recovery. That's how it works because he now sees something in his life that he didn't see. He's no longer a victim of that. He wished he wouldn't have had that, right? We all have that stuff in our life. Like we wished we didn't do that stupid thing, but we did. So we own it. I mean, he was a child. That's a little different, right? He didn't decide, but we own it. We regret it. We even mourn it sometimes. And then we try to deal with it. If you live your life like that, you'll be a lot better than going to a doctor and it's either bad luck genetics or a virus. That's what they tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, it totally ties in with um, what's come up different times around the idea of like the, the truth really does heal. And there's something that happens when we come to it ourselves. Cause like you said, I'm sure there's a piece in there where that person probably on some level knew, but he maybe knew. to arrive at it to a certain point and hear it back. And then it's like, whatever happens at that point when there's a knowingness of that truth that they came to that's where that that sort of um whatever it is but it's like i i know even in in my my own experience with people and even myself it's when i arrive at that something just opens that um that provides a space for things to just dissolve um, yeah that's the magic of of human contact or or with even with animals, they do that. They help you do that too. And by the way, Tia, I didn't mean to cut you off there and and denigrate your brain thing. So I, <laughs> I, I, no, I hope you. Okay. I actually appreciate your your questioning because I think 
what it ultimately does is bring us to a place to constantly check in and ask, you know, how do I know that? What do I know for sure? And, and then yeah. keeps us going, um, going forward, investigating and looking at things from different, different vantage points. And really that's, that's what we welcome wholeheartedly here. So thank you for that. And everybody needs to remember that the powers that be have said this is not like a conspiracy theory. This is their own words. Our agenda is so that everything you believe, right, that's different than I know I have a hand because that's my experience of life. But everything I believe my hand is created by my DNA coding for the proteins that make up a hand. That's a belief system. And they told me that everything I believe is wrong. Interestingly, how do we, we you know, we can check that. You can take a worm and cut their head off. I have photos of these studies and then expose it to different electromagnetic fields of other kind of worms, different species of worms, and they'll grow ahead of whatever the new species that you've uh, exposed them to the field is. And that immediately is incompatible with, it's their own DNA that is coding for their structure. Because mm -hmm. the DNA didn't change, right? They still have the old worm DNA, supposedly, but, they grow a different head. That whole model is, <laughs> you know, if you if you read Watson and Crick's original Nature paper of 1953 in Nature, where they got the double helix, that's the first. That's when the double. They said we assumed a angle of rotation of such and such. Now. The definition of a double helix is an angle of rotation, right? And and so you read it and you say, what do you mean? You didn't measure it? Like, you didn't measure anything. There's not a measurement in the whole paper. They assumed it was a double helix. So it was a double helix. They assumed the rotational angles, which were a double helix. Therefore, it's a double helix. If I assume I can walk backwards, you know, well, anyway, I don't know the analogy there, but you know <laughs> what I mean? That's the whole problem. It's an assumption. There's no measurement. There's no evidence anywhere. Not a single measurement in the whole paper. I mean. Dr. Cowan, what does, what does school look like? Mm -hmm. What does education look like for our children in in the world that we're ultimately wanting to create? Well, like, I don't know if this is not an exact quote, but like Winston Churchill said, not that I like Winston Churchill, but the, you know, school is completely different than education. School is indoctrination camps. And by the way, I mean any school. I mean public school, I mean all the different private schools, I mean homeschooling. They are indoctrination camps of adults indoctrinating you into a worldview and a model which they mostly don't even know where it came from. So I would eliminate the world's the word school from I wrote a book about this which never got published because they said this is too weird um like the rest of the stuff i say isn't weird <laughs> i mean seriously <laughs> uh but anyways um you know ivan illich was one of my heroes you know he wrote the book de-schooling society so the bottom line is uh literally if not Actually, everything needs to be voluntary. I'm talking taxes. I'm talking uh, education. I'm talking vaccines, everything. Voluntary. You don't have to pay taxes in my worldview. 
if you choose not to, period. There's nothing, anytime there's, there's, you have to, or something bad is going to happen to you, right? That's power over, that's authoritarian domination, which only ends badly. And so anybody who's trying to make people go to school or do homeschooling or follow a curriculum, the reality is, I know from my own experience, like, I don't learn stuff I'm not interested in. I don't I don't pay attention to it. And there's things I don't like. I'm not good at fixing cars. I just take it to other people. I just I just don't get it. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I'm not learning it. I don't care what anybody says. And you take children and you just expose them to the real world, like trees and frogs, and and let them ask questions. And they'll take it from there. And, you know, over the years, uh, I had so many people, because I worked as a school doctor until I wised up a little bit. Um, People, I don't know how many scores, hundreds of people came to me. I'm worried that my child won't learn to read. And eventually I said, here's what I want you to do. Live in the normal world like you do, right? And do the normal things like people read to their children or tell them stories and stuff. And see if you can keep them from reading by the time they graduate they're out of high school age, right? Now, I don't mean if the child says, you know, what's this letter? You say T, right? Because that's like normal. If 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 I said, you know, what what's around your neck? You say, well, it's a biogeometry thing. You don't just say, I'm not telling you, <laughs> you know, right. like that's stupid. So what's this like? What does this word say? Right. So you don't say, oh, that's really good that you got this word. And what about this word? No, you just answer the question and go on. I can guarantee you, you will not keep your child from learning to read, even by the time they're around 12. And so given that that's the case, why are you wasting your time teaching them to read? when the only possible outcome is they will learn it themselves. Why bother? And in fact, I got to the point, maybe this is why they didn't publish this book on school or raising children. The only way you can keep a child from reading, there's only one way. You know what that is? Is try to teach them when they're not interested. (laughs) because then any self-respecting child will say screw this guy i'm not doing this because because he's he's an asshole (laughs) he's trying to get me to do something and i'm not interested yeah And, and then they'll just do it to spite you and teach you a lesson that if you're stupid enough to try to get them to learn this that they don't care about you deserve to be punished and worry and and st- spend up spend all your money spend sending p- you know people to reading specialists <laughs> and going broke you know it's you, you, you deserve it cuz i f- i had to figure this out on my own <laughs> except for you try to get me to do it and i'm not interested yeah it's it's so true though it really is i mean we've got a a 5 and a 7 year old and so and an 18 year old and an 18 year old and um I mean, I, we've seen this across all the whole board, like right from, you know, I remember with my stepson going through and just thinking, really was not interested in anything until he was. And when he was, until he like, was, boom, all in, like he just got really all in when he decided um, it, and that was what he wanted to do with our little ones. Well, he read his first book and I don't know if he read the entire book, but he read his first book when he was 16 years old. Yeah, my, I mean, my daughter, back when I still thought school was reasonable, I, I didn't really <laughs> think so, but um, she couldn't read Run, Spot, Run in fifth grade. And teacher calls me up, it's Waldorf school. Mm-hmm. Tom, do you know your daughter can't read anything? Fifth grade. 
So I called her over. I said, what's this? And she had it memorized, the page, you know? So she said, <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. What about this thing? You never saw this before. No, nope. she didn't know a single word. So I said to the teacher, the teacher was new for her. I said, there's only one thing I want. Only you have to do this. A, no remedial work, like just regular class. And nobody teases her about this. Just go on. I don't, you don't have to try to teach her anything. Just, just, just play it like she's normal. No teasing, no remedial work. About six months later, she read Mists of Avalon. Uh, now, that was main, maybe not a good choice. Uh, I didn't read the book until afterwards. <laughs> it's a pretty racy book, but uh, I can see. At, 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 it got her interested. <laughs> yeah, she, got, she was pretty damn interested in that book. <laughs> and once she got the hang of that's what they were talking about in this book, she could figure out how to read <laughs> like real quick and again i probably should have read the book first i don't know who where she got the book but <laughs> that's what i mean uh you know the only thing you could have done to stop that was try to te you know or teaser or something mm -hmm. and that was a really good lesson for me you know it's 30 years ago um you don't need the all that stuff in school you know like when you teach somebody to, to do arithmetic. So you, you they want to build a tree house or a fort, right? Or a thing. And you send them to a guy who's like into building forts. And he's, you know, he's doing the wood. And the guy says, well, you have to calculate this side has got to be the same, you know, minus the three things as this side. And the little boy says, what do you mean by uh, sub subtract this from this? The guy says, what do you mean? You don't know six minus three? No. What is that? Look, I can't teach you to build this fort unless you know how to what six might because you don't know how to measure. I guarantee that child comes home and says, Mom and Dad, you teach me how to subtract by Friday or I'm going to find somebody who will. Because this guy says I can't build this fort until I figure out how to do that. Mm. Yeah, it's the complete yeah. opposite of, of how it is right now. And, and, you know, like when you were talking before about teaching to read and then um, why would somebody actually keep sort of, you know, forcing someone to try to read when they're really not wanting to read. And it's it's all because you're you're told that there's a problem if they're not reading by a certain age. And yeah. then and then that creates a bunch of fear for the parent where they're like, Okay, and they're they're down the rabbit hole on twenty years where it's like they're unemployed on the side of the road or something, and that's where they go. So then yeah. it's like, even though I'm a bad parent, you're going to be absolutely. a drunken, homeless yeah. bum, a yeah. ward of the state. Well, it comes back yeah. to what you said at the very beginning with, um, you know, shame, school ignorance, all of these different pieces, and um, yeah. like I I think what's really important as a parent is, you know, catch when those feelings come up in you you know, yourself. And I know we, we try and do this and, you know, this is like a work in progress. I mean, every day you get another opportunity to yeah. see what, what of your own shit kind of pops up that you're kind of tied back into these old programs around stuff. But I'll see this with our kids at different times, something will come up and then I'm trying to get something to happen. Then I have to check like, why, why am I trying so hard to get that yeah. to happen? What's actually going on? And it you usually happens when we get together with family and they're like, what? They, they don't know how to read yet. And she's seven. <laughs> Yeah, or they can't behave like he throws the, the ice cream on the wall. And yeah. then you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm a horrible parent, you know, and, and this guy, he's going to end up in prison. And, and, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> and the reality is the the children's their their role in life is to teach their parents how to be better people. And if you're so obtuse that you think you need to control this person's behavior, they're going to show you that there's no controlling my behavior. So you either give it up and become like a responsible, mature human being, right? Or I'm going to make your life miserable. And they do. Like they <laughs> scream at night, you know, 
And so you can't sleep. As soon as you fall asleep, they start screaming or pee the bed, you know. <laughs> and you think they have a problem when the reality is you if you don't if you to pee the bed, uh, you know, like uh, any normal person would make you pay for that. And they do mm -hmm. until you give it up. And I, I remember, you know, I try to force my children to eat. Uh, that's what most parents do. Eventually, I realized he's going to either eat or not. And if he starves, he starves. And, and my youngest son said, so you're not going to try to force me to eat? And I said, how am I going to do that? He said, well, you could take a stick, you know, <laughs> said, or make make it so I can't go outside after dinner if I don't eat. I said, what's the point of that? <laughs> You want to go outside? Go outside, and play. You know, I don't care. And then he ate because <laughs> it's no fun getting somebody's goat who 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 doesn't you know who can't get their goat got as they say. Yeah, and this sort of model requires the. Um, it really requires a certain level level of um, I think awareness and and reflection on the parents' part to just to catch that process when it's happening because otherwise you're not you're going to get hooked into your yeah. your own patterns and and then you just keep playing this out and i think even preceding that it's like changing the way that we think about kids as them coming in with a blank slate that we need to um, fill them up with all of the things that they need to live a productive healthy life and really look at it from a complete 180 on that like they're coming in as their own individual with a lot of stuff and how do we create some you know parameters of of safety and, and those sort of pieces but allow allow them to just be able to be yeah. who they are um and i also think tom like within that it's like it then requires you know because these are part of what we when we're talking about is creating this new world it's like that usually requires then parents to really do that, we have to relook and rework how we're doing things, you know, even even the time that we've got available, where do we prioritize all of these different things, because to do that, you, you've you got to, to you have to chill out yourself a little bit, and you have to be able to create some space to allow those, those constructs to be in place to be able to facilitate that, that natural evolution for that kid. And, and, and you right all that and you have to own your mistakes. And I got to the point, this is a, uh, I would say a radical theory, but so be it. So that doesn't sound like you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, right. So autistic children, I had a lot to do with them over the years. And a lot of them, not all of them were related to vaccines. And I ended up thinking, see, I always asked myself, and particularly with children, like, what would I do in that situation? What, why would this, what, what would I do given this? So here you are a child and you go in, come into the world and you're all happy and enthusiastic. And day one, somebody injects you with poison. Your parents agreed. Day, then two months later and they stick you with stuff and all kinds of, horrible stuff and you're like what the heck you know like what's this about two months four months six months more poison injecting you torturing you you're torturing you. what would i do in that situation if i was this genius child i tell you i came up with the idea i would make their life miserable because then they might listen to me and think, reevaluate, and think, you I really want to inject this child with poison? Like, this is my decision, my charge. Like, this, guy, this child came into the world, and I'm making decisions for them, and I'm poisoning the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. And not to say the poison itself has a negative repercussion, too. So that's the complicating factor. But there's a... There's an intention here. So I make their life miserable. How do I do that? I act weird. I throw my feces on the wall. I spin around. 
I embarrass them in front of their friends and their family. I just do everything I can to make their life miserable. Some of them will then think, shit, I got to reevaluate stuff. I got to reevaluate what I'm, what we're eating and whether I want to keep poisoning them. And the reason I, I came to that was I decided that these autistic type of children, they're not the problem. They're, this is a communication strategy, mm -hmm. albeit a heroic, you know, aggressive one, right? You know, this is like last ditch effort. But I had one of the worst autistic ch child ever that I've seen. And I said to the parent, I don't think there's anything wrong with him. I think he's just trying to tell you that you've got to do things different. And it was amazing. The child immediately stopped acting the way that he had acted for years and looked at the, ch the parent like, what are you going to do with this? And, you know, the mother was taken aback. Oh, well, can't you detox him and fix him? And blah? no, the, what are you going to? And and then came a lot of tears. Got child got better. Because the situ, it was not his problem. I mean, he had some problems that, you, you know, we had to work out because it becomes habitual, right? Yeah. You, you don't eat and you get bowel trouble and, you know, you get into trouble. So, but he he even went from, he wouldn't need anything they said. He literally came in and said, Dr. Cowan, what do you think I should eat now? I said, we eat this for a month, see what happened. Tell me, come back, tell me how you feel. And he would tell me, ah, it's, I don't like this way. So, okay, we do something different. And it was, once I saw that, you know, there's no going back. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's beautiful. I um, I I know when I've seen children too that diagnosed with the same sorts of things, and having that communication with the parent can be huge. It's like, and <laughs> I heard something very similar with that. It was more around um, oppositional defiant and ADHD and all of these types of pieces of of things that kids get diagnosed with, and um, Sometimes I think it's it's really clear with that when you start to hear the whole story when you're talking to the parents and you can you can even you can you can even hear when they're when they're going through the whole story how much stuff probably just needs to be redone in a new way because it's 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 creating conflict you know what's what's going on with the family and how they're interacting with things or where they're where they're putting their time or how they're prioritizing or any of this stuff and just changing that without doing anything particularly to the child starts to create that shift. Yeah, I had a child with oppositional defiant disorder. And after I talked to him for 20 minutes, even though the parents said he wouldn't talk to me, but he was telling me about the frogs and everything in his place. And so it ends up he because he got kicked out of school and diagnosed because he threw a vase at somebody at a little girl glass vase and sort of hurt her so i said well why'd you throw the vase at her she said, so they kicked me out of school yeah. <laughs> i mean the guy should be a general right he's a brilliant str strategist, <laughs> strategist of how to accomplish i hate this place and i want to go home and catch tadpoles mm -hmm. yeah and so he accomplished that in a way that made sense and and then i was able to say so if we decide you want to go to school, how would how would that work? Well, you have to tell them to do such and such. Like, I want this much outside and this much this, and then I'll go. And I won't do that. I won't throw the vase at anybody anymore. <laughs> Fine. So I said, I'll see what I can do. So I go to the teacher and say, you got to let this child, or he's going to start throwing vases at <laughs> And it worked. Here's, here's the agreement. Yeah. Here's the contract. He, he, and I said, you know, Joe, do you agree to this? Yep. <laughs> Tom, do you I still know? remember. I'll tell you this final thing. When I, we we get we ended up with this agreement, and as soon as we got the agreement, the guy, little boy, is like seven plus. 
he stands up, sticks his hand out, he says, Thanks, mister. Uh, oh. <laughs> and he walks out, you know, boom, 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 like, <laughs> see you later. Oh my gosh. That's finally awesome. somebody talks some sense yeah. around. <laughs> it's like good talk. Good talk. Yeah. <laughs> see you later, mister. <laughs> Oh man, uh, Tom! Do you think? No, I try not to think. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's probably best. Um, as far as changes that are going to take place in school system and 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 just this whole concept we're talking about and being able to create an environment that's going to be really beneficial and hospitable for our kids to not run into the same patterns of limitation and indoctrination that that for the vast majority all of us have gone through so that we can sort of minimize that what is that going to look like then sort of from a bigger scale from your perspective like is it school systems as we know it are going to totally revamp and change or is it going to come from individuals just they're going to go away yeah they'll become like uh flower vases or something or, or community centers where people can go to, if they, you know, want to teach somebody how to fix a car, right? So they have like garages at high school. So, you know, if somebody in the, I mean, they have this resource, this place, and they have some stuff like lathes and woodworking sometimes. So they have some useful stuff. And so it's just completely voluntary. If you want to teach somebody woodworking, you know, how to make a, a whatever, a, a, a cold frame, you just say, I'm, te- I, I'm going to make a cold frame and show whoever wants to build a cold frame next Thursday. And by the way, you have to know what a hammer is, or I'm not teaching. And then some people will come and some people won't. And then you just go from there. And that's all, that's all. And you can use bulletin boards and maybe the internet to as just to say what the event is or and it could be anything you could teach people dostoevsky you could pe- teach people how to fix cars how to garden how to write poetry D- it doesn't matter everybody gets to decide what they want to do and what they want to offer and that's the way that educational system will work now the powers that shouldn't be don't want that because then people might actually be educated and realize that they've been lied to. So they will do whatever they can to, to not have that happen. And I'm not a fortune teller, so I don't know who's going to win this. Mm -hmm. We'll see. What can people do right now? Do you think it's some of the most important things that we can do, people that are listening to this show, to start to put the framework down to create this this new world that we're talking about? Anything that's not voluntary, think about whether you want to do that or not. Because some things have consequences, right? So if you don't pay certain fees to you know and this is gets tricky because there are ways around that but like if you don't pay your property tax they could take your house away that's not actually true and i know i know you could get a lot of people write in don't i know the sovereignty movement and that they don't have any right to do that and i know something about that uh but but what i mean is there are things that have consequences and so you may not want to do uh, to make a stand on all those things tomorrow, right? Like not paying your income tax until you know the ropes. Mm-hmm. But y- your commitment to yourself is I am not going to, if I want to be a free sovereign person, that means. No, but you don't give anybody the right to coerce you, force you to do anything you don't want to do. Anything. Have sex, pay taxes, uh, go to school, take shots, nothing. 
Now, over time, again, there's some things you may decide to compromise for various reasons in the interim, but you know what you're doing. You know you don't want to do that. It's temporary. And by the way, you don't support anybody running for office of any sort who who is running for office because the whole principle of government is the forcing of people to do stuff they wouldn't otherwise do. I mean, that is the principle of government. Uh, and so we don't need that anymore. And we don't exactly know what the world will look like because it's kind of never been done like that. But it sort of also has. I mean, I think traditionally it was done like that. Uh, but that step by step is the world that I hope that we create. And it's not going to come from, you know, leaders as they are today, politicians, the government, the banks. They're not doing that. They are the obstacle. And but the obstacle is really our own fear. Yeah. Oh, if I don't if I don't pay taxes, they're not going to they're not going to shovel my driveway or clear the roads, and then I'm going to have a heart attack and I won't be able to get to the ER, right? That's the fear. So you mean you can't, like, organize with your neighbors to everybody chips in $100 and you hire Joe down the road who has his own snowplow? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't figure that out? You know, and if somebody doesn't want to pay, fine. They don't plow the road. That's the way, That's the world that I'm looking for. Dr. Cowan, do you see this level of sovereignty that we're all innately yearning for? Is this is this requiring a whole different way of interacting with our local community in the way that perhaps we haven't for a very long time? Yes, it's a good question. And we have to interact as free men and women interacting voluntarily with our other free men and women and having you know fun times and relationships and doing good work like building a barn with people who want to do that right that's great I'm, I'm like all for that if you want you can find 10 people and sometimes it's because then you might help them build a barn or build a woodshed or give them a hundred bucks or cook them soup or if they're not feeling well come over and sit with them or something but even that it isn't necessarily tit for tat it's human people men and women will do that just because it's a good it feels good mm -hmm. and it's fun right it's fun to go help somebody's garden and you don't say to yourself well i better get six tomatoes out of this i mean but it turns out if you don't go in with the energy of I better get six tomatoes, they give you 10 tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They all it always does. They just do because they they're happy that you came and you're fun and told stupid jokes, you know. It, oh, it's fun. That's the that's life within your community. And as soon as anybody says, no, I'm the boss. And if you don't help this guy build build his barn, I'm going to throw your ass in prison. I don't want to do that. I don't even like this guy. I'm not doing it. Okay, you have to pay a thousand bucks because then we're gonna we're gonna do it. I don't want to give you a thousand bucks. Yeah, it goes right back to like we were talking about with the kids. It's like. If you if you're happy to do it, you're going to do it and you're going to actually put a ton of energy into it because you want to. And as soon as you're kind of told you have to or as soon as there's all this sort of structure and box Punishment. around it, yeah, it, it innately just pushes you. You don't want to do it and then you feel forced yeah. to and it creates all of this other stuff. So um, I, I know one thing that's happening in our community is groups are forming where there's different ways of supporting each other and doing different things. And it's a, I, I actually recommend if that resonates with you, reach out to your own community, see if you can create these different things, find out how different people yeah. can support each other in, in different ways. Everybody's got different talents, different gifts, different, different pieces of the puzzle 
that you might find, oh, that's awesome. And you might not think that even what you've got to offer is the biggest thing, but for somebody else, that might be a really big deal, right? right. So th this is part of the exciting times I think we're in. Tom, I know we've kind of run up on time here. I yep. wanted to ask you, Tom, quickly with regards to then, this takes us to the monetary system of the future. How do you see that? What do you see that looking like? Yeah, that. It's complicated, and I don't. I don't think I have an answer, except I know that the whole Federal Reserve system needs to go. That needed to not happen in the first place, and any central bank currency needs to not happen. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a matter of using gold or silver because that it is not is not the answer either. Uh, the answer, and and I don't know that we actually have the answer because any money is is backed by belief systems, right? And the you know the dollar is backed by the by the idea that if you don't take the dollar, we're going to fuck you up. That's period. That's it. If you don't do this, we're bombing you. And we've done that a number of times. Uh, so. What I would think eventually will happen is a lot of local currencies uh, that people decide, you know, well, let's use this, whatever it is, doesn't really matter because it's not real anyways. Mm -hmm. And they make something and then, then people have access to it. And it's based on the faith and trust in the community, the goodwill among the people. And then maybe if they show goodwill, they can trade that with other communities and other people. And there probably will be hundreds of these different currencies. And since there's no government, you don't have to pay taxes in the in any currency because there's no government. And the reason why we have a single currency is essentially because the government said, if you don't pay your taxes in dollars, you're going to jail. So that had to, that ended up with everybody using the dollar. It's a threat. You know, this is all the whole system is based on violence and threats. And so we because there's no government to pay anything to, then people can do whatever currency they want. And then people get to decide whether they will accept that or not. Like if you want me to, you know, dig a ditch for you. And I don't want that currency. I want something else. So then people will decide and whatever works will come to the forefront. And my guess, it will be many different things. You you may have your Cowans at some point here. At some point, yeah. In the future. <laughs> Dr. Cowan, when you were speaking of um, like not paying property tax or the possibility of not paying taxes, I'm just curious because we're we're looking at all of these pieces as well and what certain laws or jurisdictions we could be looking at in order to gain more sovereignty. Can I ask what you found through this process of of looking I, into I, I don't know I, I know almost nothing. Okay. But I can tell people that they should go to the the end of COVID uh series. Yeah. It's by the way forward, Alex Zach, friend of mine, yeah. and they have a whole module, I guess you call it, on the laws of mankind, and and a step by step teaching program for how people can go about regaining their sovereignty, how to interact with current laws and current government, and there is a system which I I am not I'm not an expert in. Gotcha. So I would rather refer people to that because they really put together a what here's what you need to know to get yourself started. Very good. Thank you. We actually interviewed one of the speakers within that series as well, Cal Washington. He yeah. was featured um, just um, in the month of July. So if people are interested, please yeah, do check right. that out. We will have future episodes coming up um speaking with yeah. people who are teaching courses on private member association and also right. individuals who are actually implementing that on the ground and operating their business from that place so right more episodes more info on that yeah he knows a lot more about it than i do so yeah it was a really fascinating conversation with him 
Um, Tom, where can people learn more about your work? I, I know we didn't get to talk too much about the um, new biology clinic you have, and you've got some courses that are on the go right now too. You've got a lot of stuff on your site and a lot of, uh, I think a lot of valuable information for people. Um, where it's can people mostly drtomcowan.com and they can, they can find the clinic in the curriculum and yeah, I'm just trying to tell people what I know and they can do with it what they want to. And we're trying to uh, allow people access to work with people who think, who think along these lines. Here's how, to, here's the new model for medicine. Mm -hmm. Sounds based great. Based reality. Thank you, Dr. Cowan. We will have those links below in the show notes and under this video as well, including if you're interested in the curriculum that is being offered, please check below for that as well. Tom, thanks so much for being a part of this show. That was that was a really fun conversation. Thank you, Dr. Cowan. Okay, thanks guys.